have slightly changed the title of my talk, as I guess you will soon see, but not the content itself. Um, so my objective is to discuss feminist and decolonial critique of Western responses or rather non-responses to the ecological crisis with regard to some general ideas uh, set out by the French psychiatrist and philosopher Félix Guattari in his seminal work from uh, 1989 entitled The Three Ecologies. Uh, the idea is to present a certain conceptual toolbox contemporary philosophy offers to better articulate and tackle global and local dimensions of the looming ecological disaster. Um, to start, just on a very general note, um, feminist and decolonial critiques might seem quite disparate, but there is actually... I'm sorry a for that, Elenka. We need to see your screen and the computer. I'm ready, but people are taking coffee and... Uh... All right, all right. Well, let's give it a minute, I guess, because for me... Give it's it a minute great. until the screen snaps. We sure. will soon both see you and hear you again. Okay. So. You're, you're in the game. All right, nice. So we can see your slides, yes, and we can hear you loud and clear. Great. Um, so you can... You can even full screen. That's it. Fantastic. We're on. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I was saying that uh, both feminist and decolonial critiques can be resembled under an umbrella term, uh, the new humanities. Uh, so it's a term that was coined by Kenneth Ruthven in the early 90s. Um, the new humanities gathers postcolonial, gender, cultural, minority, indigenous, and other studies. And what resembles these approaches it, is that they aim at acknowledging the agency of socially and epistemologically subordinate people in the making of their own histories. So these quote unquote alternative theoretical approaches are especially viable with regards to the ecological crisis, which as we know, uh, has the most destructive effects on the most vulnerable parts of the global population. Um, the works of Guattari, notably the ones co-authored with Gilles Deleuze, have always been in a close dialogue and conceptual sympathy with these authors. What is at the core of Guattari's work on the three ecologies, as well as, uh, as of other critiques that will be discussed later on, is the idea that the ecological crisis demands a radical reconfiguration of the ways we think and structure our relationship to the planet, to society and to ourselves, and that this reconfiguration cannot happen in a uniform standardized way in which global, globalization proceeds, but rather through mutually related forms of heterogeneity. So in order to better understand this heterogeneity set out by Guattari, uh, I will evoke two contemporary authors that are very prominent in the field of postcolonial studies, uh, the literary theorist, and uh, feminist critic Gaiti Spivak and the Indian historian Deepesh Chakrabarti. Um, and before passing on the next slide, just a, a sort of a note, uh, while Guattari's Three Ecologies were first published in 1989, the other two works we will evoke both, come out, both came out in the last 10 years. And I think if we just look at the covers of the works, it's quite telling to note how much darker the subject of ecology has become since Guattari's first publication. Um, okay, now, sorry, my computer seems to be blocking. Um, <clears throat> the Three Ecologies reads as a manifesto, both through its clear and direct tone uh, which somehow contrasts with some other works that uh, Guattari published along with Deleuze that are much more cryptic, and by the articulation of a both diagnosis and a blueprint for action. Uh, the book translates a simple and quite intuitive idea that uh, to really change the direction our societies are going, that is towards a total devastation of the planet, we need to radically rethink all sets of relations that constitute our societies, as they are all different expressions of the same phenomenon. In Guattari's words, the change we need is so radical that we cannot talk in terms of philosophy anymore. Uh, if we consider that philosophy uh, is a love and a quest for wisdom, Guattari suggests that we first need a home 
a planet where we can exercise it. Indeed, the prefix eco comes from a Greek term oikos that designates a house or a home. A proposition of an ecosophy compels us to anchor our thought in our environment with all the contradictions that this entails. So if ecology is a branch of science dealing with the relationship of living things to their environments, ecosophy is a transformation of philosophy that brings us back to our lived relationships on the planet. Guattari stresses that the environmental crisis appears in a context of breakup and decentralization um, of a multiplication of antagonisms and processes of singularization. So contrary to previous stages of class struggle, we can no longer dream of creating an univocal ideology, but it is conceivable on the other hand that the new eco-philosophical example indicates the lines of reconstruction of human praxis in the most varied domains. Um, perhaps what connects us today more than the common class oppression is this looming catastrophe. And the question is, can we reconstruct human praxis around that? And more precisely, can we reconstruct human praxis around that in a way that it does not deepen the existing inequalities? The ethico-political uh, ethico scope of ecosophy thus includes phenomena such as racism, phallocentrism, back down pla uh, planning, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so what is at stake um, is the reconstruction of social and individual practices that we can classify in social ecology, mental ecology, and environmental ecology. Um, Guattari diagnoses an increasing uh, deterioration of human relation with the socius, the psyche, and the nature or the planet. Uh, this deterioration is due not only to environmental and objective pollution, but is also the result of a certain incomprehension and fatalistic passivity towards these issues as a whole among both individuals and governments. Um, so here is how he explains the interrelatedness of these three fields, and I quote him. Uh, it is quite wrong to make a distinction between action on the psyche, the socius, and the environment. Refusal to face up uh, to the erosion of these three areas, as the media would have us do, verges on a strategic infantilization of opinion and a destructive neutralization of democracy, end of quote. Um, indeed, the three ecologies are like interchangeable lenses of points of view, demonstrating that uh, nature cannot be separated from culture. Um, <clears throat> regarding the latter, um, so um, the relationship between nature and culture, uh, Guattari cites a compelling example in order to help us grasp it, where he compares Donald Trump to an invasive species of Elvis, algae. Uh, and I propose to read this paragraph together uh, to get a taste of it. And uh, again, I remind you that this was written as early as actually, well, more than 30 years ago. Uh, so I quote, um, now more than ever, nature cannot be separated from culture. In order to comprehend the interactions between ecosystems, the mechanosphere and the social and individual universes of reference, we must learn to think transversally. Uh, just as Manskas and mutant algae invade the lagoon of Venice, so our television screens are populated, saturated by the generate images and statements. In the field of social ecology, men like Donald Trump are permitted to proliferate freely like another species of algae, taking over entire districts of New York and Atlantic City. He redevelops by raising rents, thereby driving out tens of thousands of poor families most of whom are condemned to homelessness, becoming the equivalent of the dead fish of environmental ecology." End of quote. So uh, there is a structural similarity between different strata of ecological phenomena. And in a way, Guattari invites us not to discriminate among them, or rather not to underestimate the influence of social and mental ecology in relation to the environmental one. Um, on the other hand, the three ecologies do not call for a unity uh, of a struggle, but rather invite us to persist in heterogeneity, as I have already mentioned. Um, and this heterogeneity 
uh, that Gadri Spivak will later on describe in terms of a relational ethics is a particular response to a question raised, uh, well, can be considered as a particular response to a question raised by uh, the already mentioned Indian historian Vipesh Chakrabarti in a text entitled The Climate of History. So how to think our common destiny in the Anthropocene, knowing that uh, the share of responsibility for its advent is not equally distributed around the globe, nor are its consequences. With other words, how to think the unity of the planet as the ecological crisis compels us to, while knowing that this unity is fractured everywhere by asymmetrical power relations demonstrated most clearly by the discrepancy between what we call the global north and global south or the center and periphery. So between zones of unequal development that are often a legacy of colonialism. Now, these divisions aren't always clear. Of course, there is a south within the north, periphery within the center, and vice versa. Our world is not fractured in clearly delimited lines. It fracture, its fractures are rather scattered. Uh, and so climate change affects us all, but in a highly differentiated way. Um, there is indeed a contradiction between our idea of the unity of the world and its dissociated character. Um, as Etienne Balibar puts it in his recent work on cosmopolitics, our world is unique but not unified. Furthermore, it seems that the process of unification, that is capitalist globalization, further divides it in terms of socioeconomic differences, access to natural resources, uh, resources and so on. Um, so in a strange way, the same processes that globalize the world also divide it. We can say that our world is a unity that suffers from the division it produces itself. The shared character of our shared world is constantly negated and not only through the destruction of the environment, obviously. All the aspects of communality of the world are being negated. Uh, the world is being negated both as a life world uh, as well as, as a refuge or a shelter um, by the policies that turn migrants into enemies and by persistent racism and ongoing wars. Uh, a question of possibility of a collective subject of history or of a cosmopolitical response to the ecological crisis uh, must be raised in these circumstances. And um, the way uh, both Spivak and Chakrabarti seem to propose to answer this question is through activating the differences to produce uh, cosmopolitical effects locally and uh, to operate a transition from a passive to an active unity of humanity. Um, since in the Anthropocene era, uh, so the era where human be became a geological agent as a species, um, we have acquired a new kind of agency we did not have before. Uh, so it seems that now um, just by the fact of living a human life, we are being agents. Uh, and this basically means that human species as such needs to become political. Um, and furthermore, uh, a political construction of species, species as such can only come about through fighting internal discriminations. Um, and here is where the necessity uh, of the quote unquote new humanities, that is of humanities produced in view of and from the point of view of the relations of oppression, may it be gendered, racial, cultural or class related, comes in as crucial. Um, it is obviously a vast topic um, that cannot be dealt with uh, sufficiently in the time we have here. Uh, but there are theoretical elements uh, that have a strategic utility in such a task uh, that I want to point out. Um, so along with Guattari's proposition of the articul articulation of three ecological registers, uh, there is the concept of a double bind as articulated by Gayatri Spivak. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so a double bind um, is a situation of being faced with conflicting demands uh, 
where it seems impossible to make a decision. The term was first coined in the 1950s by a British anthropologist, Gregory Bateson, but Gayatri Spivak really developed it further by designating this double bind to be the situation of a post-colonial subject um, that is facing both the demands of his culture and the demands of capitalist modernity. Um, we can also easily imagine a double bind as a situation of a gendered subject facing the demands of both persistent traditional gender roles along with the new emancipated ones. Or in a broader sense, we can say that the whole of post-colonial theory is in a situation of a double bind, as far as it seems that the critique of the Western capitalist modernity can only be expressed in the language of the same modernity. And of course, last but not least, it is also a double bind situation we are all experiencing facing the ecological disaster. We know uh, we should stop living the way we are living right now ASAP, and yet it seems we have no choice but to keep living in the way we are living. Um, but as we will see, Spivak argues that these double binds are actually productive spaces one should remain awkwardly in instead of attempting to exit them quickly. Uh, as Spivak puts it in an article entitled The Double Bind Starts to Kick In, I quote, uh, you cannot be against globalization, you can only work collectively and persistently to turn it into a strategy-driven rather than crisis-driven globalization." End of quote. Um, and I believe this strategy-driven globalization that Spivak evokes here is a very similar strategy to what Guattari advocates for in the Three Ecologies, as we, uh, as, um, yeah, we will see later on. Um, so, contrary to a generalized ethical agenda of universalist humanist approaches, strategy-driven globalization always operates on the intersection of the abstract capital and the concrete culture. Um, <clears throat> while in Spivak's terms, globalization or capital financing the globe is the abstract, the virtual, the pure structure, culture, on the other hand, is concrete. Uh, culture is, I quote, purely textile where the edge of the cloth, uh, where the edge of the cloth where we are woven always unfurls the head in a future always anterior, um, end of quote. So the bet we are taking here is that this messy unfurling of culture and idioms strategically intertwined in the abstract fabric of capital is not insignificant in the ways we imagine and co-create the planet. Uh, Guattari advances a similar thesis in The Three Ecologies, suggesting that there's a conjunction of ecological and separatist demands and a conjunction of ecological and identitarian claims, insofar as both are a call against globalization as an equalizing force of industrial development. As a matter of fact, this is not a purely speculative claim. There is actually some empirical evidence of that. Um, Indeed, researchers in various disciplines report that areas with high biological diversity, such as uh, biodiversity hotspots and high uh, biodiversity wilderness areas, are also home to about 70% of the world's languages. Certain studies geographically link the endangered species to endangered languages, endangered languages, sorry. Um, this can be explained by the fact that linguistic diversity is often linked to small groups with traditional economics. The extinction of these indigenous languages then also means the loss of information about rare and fragile environments. Now, Spivak uh, warns against any naive hope of indigenous culture saving the planet. Uh, in another article entitled The Imperative to Reimagine the Planet, she writes, I quote, I now know that the eco beyond as transformed by centuries of progress, progress bears no resemblance to what the Aboriginal had learned to protect." End of quote. But, and this is, I believe, an important point, Spivak also refuses to point uh, the point of view according to which uh, the culture that, for instance, multicultural migrants bring with them as metropolitan citizens would be just a part of unreason that would cling along the reason with capital R of European enlightenment. 
to take this position would be to ignore the idiomatic strength of cultures through which they perform a critique, however rudimentary, of the limits of the rational structures of the civil society. So the question I want to raise now is how to, how to persist awkwardly, to borrow the term from Gabriel uh, Huddleston, in the face of the environmental disaster in the way that is strategy driven. Um, <clears throat> both Guattari and Spivak seem to suggest that the answer to this question has to do with the radical redefinition of the way we think of the relations that constitute our lives on this planet, a redefinition that can only take place through an aesthetic education. They both approach ethical political ecosophy as a practical exercise of the impossible. Impossible because as all ethical tasks, it obliges us to face radical authority. Mm, and yes, I propose we read together uh, this beautiful yet somehow enigmatic formulation Spiva gives of this uh, in, in the previously cited text on the double bind. Uh, I quote, radical alterity, if one can say it, appears to require an imagining that is the figuration of the ethical as the impossible. If ethics are grasped as a problem of relation rather than a problem of knowledge, it is not enough to build efficient databases. It is necessary to imagine the other, in the original text it's the other woman, as an other as well as a self, end of quote. So the other that Spivak talks about here is the fellow human being, but the radical alterity that characterizes the other in this sense and calls for an ethical responsibility is also the planet. Um, <clears throat> and here uh, Spivak proposes a particular concept of the planet uh, and to explain it, she compares it to the globe, which is an abstract and controllable sphere. The impulse to control and appropriate otherness that characterizes globalization is the same impulse as the one behind colonial enterprise or the type of domination that was historically structuring gendered relationships. So contrary to the globe that is smooth and predictable, the planet is mysterious and discontinuous as Spivak writes, and she proposes the planet to override the globe. Um, so what Spivak suggests by inviting us from the globe to the planet is a form of surrender to alterity in its unpredictability that uh, entails a practice of responsibility or rather responsiveness to alterity and that not as a duty but as a collective right. And I would uh, conclude with that. Um, thank you very much.